If you're engaged in nonprofit fundraising or developing a fundraising strategy for a nonprofit organization, there's something you might want to know. And that is that charitable giving might be on the decline. This issue and what we can do about it as fundraisers is what is discussed in the book, The Generosity Crisis. And in this video, I'm super excited to share a conversation with one of the authors of the book, The Generosity Crisis, to learn about some tips and strategies we can take away to make sure our fundraising is effective despite this charitable giving decline. Welcome or welcome back. I'm Amber Melanie Smith. I'm a nonprofit founder and executive director, and I make these videos on YouTube all about fundraising, nonprofits, social impact, social enterprise, all those good things. And I'm so excited that you're here today. Don't forget to check out my website, foundertofulltime.com, where I have some online trainings and my blog for further resources on getting started with your nonprofit, social enterprise, and more. Without further ado, let's jump into our chat with one of the authors of the book, The Generosity Crisis, Nathan Chappelle. Hey, Nathan, great to see you. How are you great today? To be here. Yeah, great to be here, Amber. I've been looking forward to this for a while now. Awesome. Well, you know, I would love to just kind of jump right in talking about your book, The Generosity Crisis, and hear more about you, your background, and how you came to write this book. Hopefully you can see it. There you go. <laughs> this book with your co-authors. Tell us more. Yeah. Well, I mean, I spent 22 years in the nonprofit um, side of things. So in as uh, started out as an executive director of a boys and girls club back in like 2000 and knew nothing about the business of philanthropy. I think I, you know, I took that crash course that a lot of us do. And, and frankly, I wish your videos were around back then because <laughs> a lot of learning by mistake and trial by fire and asking, you know, phone a friend kind of thing. Um, and that's what's special about our sector is that we're willing to do that, but there are a lot more resources um, like what you provide now to, to help kind of accelerate that and short the shorten the learning curve. But I think somewhere around um, halfway through my journey, I, it was 2012, I was actually working at a consulting firm and I was asked to um, prepare a report about something that was interesting to me. And it didn't, it could have been any topic, um, but we had to present it back to our other consultant. So it's kind of like a high pressure deal, like you're train the trainer kind of thing. And I picked um, a topic on the evolution of mega gifts. So I was I was tracking kind of like disparity of wealth and you know the rise of the number of billionaires every year and that kind of thing. And and it was 2012, so right on the heels of when Warren Buffett and Bill Gates enacted the uh, Giving Pledge. And that Giving Pledge, from a historical perspective, was interesting because the hundred you know hundred years before that was like from the early 1900s, Carnegie and Rockefeller had, uh, well, actually Carnegie wrote the gospel of wealth, which was kind of like the same thing, like give your money away while you're alive and don't be a coward. And so I just had this really interesting, like, like thought in my head was like, is this going to be good or bad for our industry? And so I, I didn't have any conclusions. I had basically left it with two questions, like, or two hypotheses. And so I, I hedged my bets, I guess is what I'm saying. I, you know, on one hand, it would be like, this giving pledge is going to inspire philanthropy like no other time in history. And it's just going to be gangbusters and great. And everyone's going to want to give and follow their suit. And then conversely, the other side was, well, people are going to feel like their gifts don't matter. And, you know, we're going to create this really, you know, large chasm between like, you know, the, the, um, you know, Bill Gates is solving polio. Why, why do I, you know, my $5 doesn't matter. Um, and so starting 2012, so I wrote that report and I kind of kept it close, um, presented it and then just kept on reading the, um, giving the USA report every year and finally got involved in giving the USA and realized that what I was feeling as a nonprofit professional and that every year I was asked to raise more money. Like we had this unquenchable thirst for more money because our mission was, you know, we hadn't solved our, our, our core value of our mission. And so we needed more money. But when we looked under the hood, we realized that we were raising less every, or we were raising it from more money from less people every year. So this is just year after year after year. And then long story short, you know, when you look under the hood, this decline is, wasn't just me and it wasn't just Boys and Girls Sub or Cancer Hospital where I worked eventually it was that most nonprofits are, are in that same boat. So there's been this like pretty dramatic decline in the, the number of people that give yet, you know, we're we keep on doing things the same way. And so the book, I think, uh, to answer your question, 
was really um, a kind of a sound the alarm kind of thing for our sector. You know, I, I joke that you don't write a book called The Generosity Crisis to get invited to parties. Um, I don't get invited to a lot of parties, but you do it based on that that inherent like almost calling or um, sense that like you're you need to do this. I never thought of myself as an author and it wasn't a bucket list thing. It was just, in fact, I tried to convince other people to write it for a few years and no one, <laughs> people like getting invited to parties, I guess. Um, and so at the end of the day, yeah, that's how, that's the uh, the origin story of where it came from. I think you're just not getting invited to the right parties yet. I would want a party to talk oh, about hey. nonprofit statistics. We might be in a rare a, crowd. A, a party of two, right. Yeah, that'd be great. We'll have a great time and we'll solve all the world's problems. That sounds amazing. Let's yeah, do that. Absolutely. All right, so I know you alluded to this just now a bit, um, but obviously the book is called The Generosity Crisis. How have we come to be here? What is the generosity crisis? What is going on? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a really important question. And I guess, you know, when we, we, we usually forewarn people with our book, it's like the first 100 pages can feel a little intense. Um, and you can translate that to maybe depressing. Um, if you If you're not prepared to like understand the gravity of the situation, uh, but it's very factual and well-researched, and we uh, have a lot of accolades on that part. Essentially, a generosity crisis, um, if we talk about just the U.S., but is, you know, 16% decline in the percentage of households that give to charity. Um, at the same time, the amount of giving has tended to go up. So essentially, what the math, how the math works out is that fewer people are giving more. And so the interesting thing is that we look um, right outside of the U.S. and we look at Canada and the UK and, and Australia, they're all on the same trajectory. This decline in giving is, is pretty profound and it it follows a lot of other um, societal changes. And so, um, and truly this is not to sell more books, but you kind of have to read the book to go through in detail the confluence of circumstances that have led to the generosity crisis. And they can go from kind of two main buckets. The, the first bucket is really internal like nonprofits and what we've done to ourselves. Like we haven't invested in R and D when we um, we've, you know, kind of almost created this like hunger games on giving Tuesday, where we're just like, have this unrelenting desire to do send more. And, um, and we've really underestimated what's, what's happened externally. And so the external changes are things like things that are outside of our control, like decline in religious participation, which plays a, a really important um, aspect of like teaching people the the fundamentals of giving, but to also things like how technology in the private sector has been used to not just um, convince people to buy products, but to create lifelong value between a person and a, a brand loyalty to like Apple or to whoever, AT&T or whoever it might be. We tend to, to kind of those AI has been used to reinforce a lot of those things. So I think it's it's really this combination between internal and external. And you almost have to unpack each one. You know, in our book, we kind of talk about 12 different perspectives on internal and 12 on external. Within your organization, you're faced with many of them, but the combination of those things, depending on where you're at and what kind of services you provide and how public or private you are, um, there's kind of something in it for everyone. And the reality is like, we're all in this together. The end result is that when we look at the math and the, the downward trend in giving, it it was it's a very easy mathematical calculation. And if something goes down year after year after year after year, it ends at zero somewhere. And so it took us like 12 seconds to realize that giving ends in the US in 49 years, if nothing changes. And that's the sounding the alarm thing of like, okay, do we think that's gonna happen? No, but like, in Canada, they're on the same trajectory, but they're starting at 20% of givers. We're starting at 49 right now, but 20 years ago, two thirds of Americans gave to charity. So I think we have a lot to lose and it's it's an absolutely an important inflection point to say, okay, here's where we're at. Let's take stock. Let's try to stop the bleeding as much as possible. And then ideally reverse that generosity crisis to inspire more charitable giving in our country. That I don't know if I'm scared or like <laughs> motivated by the challenge, <laughs> um, but 49 years. Wow. I mean, it feels like we just have a generation to solve a bunch of problems in the world, don't we? 
<laughs> we we do, and you know, and when we unpack AI a little bit, um, we realize that you know where we underestimated what we thought AI was going to do for humanity and bring people together and connect people in ways new and novel ways. It's actually had the opposite effect. So, you know, we've seen this acceleration and decline in happiness and increases in anxiety and depression. And, and so, um, you know, I think this is, it's absolutely important. Like we are at a different place now. We know more than we've known before. And that's kind of this like sound the alarm moment with the generosity crisis that we hopefully can get back to healthy, more sustainable ways of fundraising. So you talked about some of the factors contributing to this generosity crisis. And it strikes me that at the same time as, as this trend, we're seeing things like the U.S. Surgeon General's report on disconnection and loneliness and isolation, especially in the, in the United States. How do you see them as connected or are they? I, yeah, I think it's absolutely connected. You know, in, in preparation for the book, I mean, I'm a fairly big reader um, and I I mean, just spent a lot of time in my own kind of personal journey of like inquiry. And and there's a book called um, The Paradox of Generosity. It's actually written by a professor at Notre Dame. And and The Paradox of Generosity is it's kind of an interesting thing. It first uncovers whether or not generosity is something inherent to us or not. And so the conclusion is, it, without having to read the book, uh, <laughs> is essentially that generosity is a pro-social behavior, that we are kind of built to, to be generous in a way. Um, and we're actually can be untaught that by in, in sways and in, in society and demands in society and things like that. Um, but that other part, you know, is really that, you know, we we are meant to be in community. Like we, you know, when we get that hit of serotonin and dopamine, it's because we're like actually doing things that help others. Um, always my lights go off. So I'll just do this and there we go. So it's our cost savings. Um, so it, it absolutely related. So as, you know, society has become more atomized. So like people become, you know, less connected to one another. And this really started, you know, really after world war two and, you know, world war two is this time where everybody came together, you know, for common cause. And then after that, the, the thing that happened that surprised people was, was not related to the war, it was related to the television. And instead of going home and like sitting on a porch with your neighbors and talking about the, the, the world and life in general and getting involved in your community, you were going home to unwind in front of a television. And, and now, I mean, fast forward many, many years. So we've seen the decline in, in civic participation for a long time, like less people giving blood, less people volunteering, less people, you know, joining PTAs and so on. So, so you know, move, you know, fast forward to now where everyone's got a television and a supercomputer in their pocket, the tendency is just to become more isolated, more isolated. If you can imagine spending one day without your phone, like how would life feel for you? Like very difficult to function anymore. But I do believe that we get to a tipping point where we call, we call a spade a spade. And I think that's what social media has done. You know, we thought it was great. And now we realize the inherent dangers of it. People are guarding themselves in different ways and creating barriers around. We're looking at screen time differently than we have before. And at the end of the day, I believe the the reckoning that comes with all that disconnection is that philanthropy, you know, becomes local, that the future of philanthropy becomes local, that, you know, that inherent biological desire to make a difference is still within us. And that enough's enough and more is more. And I can't absorb any more that we come back to center, we come back to our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers and our community, and we we go to make a difference. And I think that's super healthy. I worked, started fundraising 20 years ago when there was no technology. People gave because I built a trusted relationship between myself and them. And I was a conduit and a vessel between you know, that person and our organization. And they gave because they believed that uh, and trusted me that I was going to put the money to best use and report back on how I used it. 20 years of, of transactional you know, fundraising has happened since then. And I think most people recognize that, that giving, and we've seen the results, you know, less, less people are giving. And I think it's because we've made that so much more transactional. I think that pendulum has swung and I think it will swing back. And I think it will swing back into a much healthier place where, you know, you and I, can do something together that neither one of us could do alone. I love that. Now I feel more optimistic about what we can do. <laughs> well, 
I, I should have told you at the very beginning, we have to warn people with our book that anytime we do a talk, we tell them in advance, it's going to feel like we're crashing the airplane, but I promise you, like right before you hit the runway, we're going to like take off again because, you know, I think we have to be inherently optimistic. Um, I think we have to address reality and then only then we can actually envision a new reality. All right. So we've talked about what's going on but there's potentially a solution here. Tell us more about this idea of radical connection and, and what it means for this decline in giving. Yeah, you know, that I, I mean, this is where we start to get more optimistic. I think inherently we know how to do this, but the, the pull of more is better has been something that's just been very pervasive in the nonprofit sector. I mean, I can tell you from 20 years of fundraising, I was always measured on, you know, filling that leaky bucket and more in acquiring more and acquiring more at any cost. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, I think what we have to do is realize that, and, and with all of that, I think our industry on, in addition, has essentially got to a point where we've equated wealthy people to philanthropy or to philanthropists. And at the end of the day, that more is better. And, and if I need more, I'm going to go after wealthy people because I need to fill that leaky bucket. I think, when we kind of reverse and remove a lot of that stigma and we we actually look mathematically, we actually know that wealth and altruism are not directly correlated, very like less than 10%. So it's, it's not the primary reason why people give by a long shot, but at the end of the day, people give because they, they feel connected and they want to make a difference. So we really came up with this, this phrase in the book, which is, you know, generosity is a manifestation of radical connection. And the way our industry has worked for the most part is thinking that generosity is a manifestation of wealth. And so we're really getting away from this and where people that resonate with our book are like, wow, this sounds like good old fashioned major gift work. And it is because good old fashioned major gift work is about getting to know people in an intimate way and that together in partnership, you could do something you know pretty incredible. And so we, not by any like magic words, because frankly, we're not that creative. We just had to come up with a word that wasn't just connection because we think connection's completely overused. Like connection can feel like affiliation or association. Like it just like, I know that place. And if it's, you know, super convenient for me, I'll maybe I'll stop by and buy that thing or super convenient for me, maybe I'll make that donation. But radical connection is like, I'll go out of my way. Like my fascination with Patagonia, like I'll go out of my way to a Patagonia store, which is never convenient because I care or or it's a nonprofit that when I talk about, I smile and I, I don't just make a donation, but I tell my friends and my neighbors about what they're doing and, and how proud I am to be affiliated with them. And so really when it gets down to it, that idea of use whatever you, word you wanna use is, but it, it just can't be connection. I think uh, our, our, the nonprofit sector has kind of almost made that a trivial kind of word. It's just like, we, it's something we just check the box and we send, a, we send a thank you letter if they make a donation over a few hundred dollars or whatever it is. But in like Ritz-Carlton ling lingo, it's called radar on antenna up. It's that every person at Ritz-Carlton, whether you're parking cars, or you're working at the front desk or cleaning rooms, radar on antenna up of like, what is the client experience? Where are they coming from? What do they need? What are their preferences? And they huddle and they work strategically together to make sure that they provide that. That's what our sector needs. And that's what we mean by radical connection. It's just like, have your radar on and antenna up of the things that actually will strengthen that bond between you and, and um, the constituent who wants to make a difference. All right, so let's take this all and translate it into practical advice for nonprofits, especially smaller or newer nonprofits. What can you do as you're growing um, and cultivating those relationships, practical stuff day to day to yeah. do what you're talking about? I mean, first I would say that I think in this, this um, era of like mass everything that small nonprofits have an advantage. And that advantage is that they are local and they're making local impact and people want to feel like they're connected to something. So I would say change your mindset from the scarcity mindset, you know, to a really more proactive and advantageous mindset. Um, I would say, you know, really as a small nonprofit, you're not burdened by a lot of bureaucracy and, and you know, kind of turning the Titanic um, as you are with like very large nonprofits. And with that said, there's a few really practical things that you can do. And one is, is how are you, how are you measuring success, your fundraising success at your organization? Is it based on revenue and how much money you raised? 
or is it based on what is the net increases in relationships that you fostered over the year? So if you started out with 100 relationships and you ended up with 120 and the next year you end up with 140, measure, not that not to say that revenue is not important, but, but even this is where we've really kind of come after writing the book to the conclusion that the generosity crisis is, is not a fundraising problem, it's an organizational problem. So boards of directors, and hopefully they're listening, um, have to recognize that measuring a nonprofit success by revenue is actually what's caused a lot of these issues. Not to say it's not important, but what is the first thing you're looking at? Is the first thing you're looking at retention and lifetime value of the people that are committed to you? And are your incentives based on fostering those relationships and, and bringing net increases in giving? Or is it just on revenue? And so I would encourage any small nonprofit, which has an advantage to say, report revenue, but make it number three. Report you know, your net increases in retention first, your lifetime value second, and then revenue third. And then the only other, like a, a really, really practical thing that I did in my career that made a transformative difference in my organization was measuring our success on a three-year rolling average. If we were measuring our success in a one-year increment, it incentivizes a lot of bad behavior and it pushes donors into our timeline versus their timeline. But if we measure fundraiser success or our own individual success or nonprofit success on three-year rolling averages, you're actually aligning yourselves and providing the freedom to really pour into a relationship and work on a donor's timeline versus yours. So those are kind of probably the, the, the takeaways that we've had from having probably 10,000 conversations in the last year that I think are really easy to, to uh, apply and they make a big difference. I love that because, you know, in a lot of my other videos on the topic of fundraising, I always talk about the critical value of relationships and people will ask me, well, how do I raise money? How do I do this? How do I have success in my campaign that I'm doing? And I'm like, well, what, what are the relationships that you already have? Um, and you have to do that first. You can't just go out and ask money or create a GoFundMe page and, and send it out into the internet and expect it to magically work. You have to have a network. You have to build these friendships first because um, people absolutely. want to hurt others that they believe in and trust. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, tell us about how people can grab their own copy of The Generosity Crisis. Well, officially Amazon, Barnes and Noble or wherever books are sold, I guess. Um, there's also, <laughs> a, it's on Audible. I really like the audio version because it, it it brings the stories to life a little bit more. But um, yeah, and then, you know, I think the thing that we do within our community is we stay connected uh, and in community. So, you know, anyone that, you know, needs help or would like more information, find me on LinkedIn and um, love connecting with new and, and different people. Awesome. And folks, I will leave the link to learn more under uh, the video as well. So I really hope that you enjoyed this. And I know I learned some things and I hope that you did too, and that you're ready to take this advice and put it to work for your good social mission. Thanks again, Nathan. All right. Thanks for having me. It's been great. All right. I'd love to hear what you think. And I'm sure Nathan would love to hear what you think as well. What do you think? Have you seen some of these giving trends play out in your community? What do you think you might do differently to amp up your own nonprofit fundraising now that you've heard about the generosity crisis? Share in the comments below. And if you are interested in checking out the generosity crisis, I'm leaving the link to go buy that book in the description below this video as well. As always, don't forget to check out my other resources, my website with my training, my newsletter, and my online community. Website is foundertofulltime.com where I have trainings on how to start a nonprofit and develop a fundraising strategy. My newsletter is linked below. I send out tips, resources, etc., on a regular basis. And my online community is Change the World or Bust on Facebook. You can go look that up and join us there with thousands of other folks from around the world making an impact. I hope to see you and thank you for your generosity. I'll see you next time.